So, um, who we can start off to tell me your story and go from there in terms of how you... Okay, well my story is different from um, the many people's stories because I was a child of about three and a half. Uh, I say about three and a half because I found my birth certificate in 1989 and um, so I know exactly how old I am now where I was born in in February 35 whereas my um, the birthday that I use no that's I was born in February 36 the birthday that I really was born was December 35 so there isn't that much of a difference but I didn't find that till 1989 mm -hmm. which was just 10 years ago my story is different because um, a million and a half children perished and I survived. That makes a big difference. Also, most children who survived were in hiding and I wound up in the concentration camps, slave labor camps, ghettos, concentration camps. My story is also different because when most, any child who lost their parents, they were lost. Whereas every time I lost somebody, somebody else came along and adopted me. And finally, by the age of nine and a half, I was adopted by somebody who brought me from Sweden, DP camp to the United States. And then shortly after we got here, she died, so I was adopted by an American family. When I was adopted by the American family, I got new parents, new grandparents, aunts and uncles. Nobody biologically related, but it started. I also had an education where most survivors didn't because by the time they came, they had to sort of fend for themselves. Um, I was born in Pietrukov which is a city not far away from Ludz, and it was the first ghetto that was started in Poland. And uh, we lived in the Jewish area, which meant that we were able to stay in the apartment that we had, but other people came in and got very crowded and very, a lot of people died of starvation and sickness and the stories that you know of. Um, when they weren't dying fast enough, um, there was an action a roundup, and the first action was against women and children, and my mother and my two brothers and I were amongst those people. We were herded through the streets into um, a large room, which turned out to be the synagogue. I've been back to the synagogue since also. It's now a library, but there are still um, um, Mug and Davids and the lanterns outside, so you can see how it had been a synagogue. And inside, if you know enough to pull to ask the librarian to pull open uh, a curtain, you can still see where the iron coat is, where the bullet was. Well, we were in that room. Thousands of people were herded into that area. And there was a man on the other side of the door. The men who were legal, who were working, were not rounded up. And he beckoned to me and he told me to run. And I don't know how it was possible that a little child would leave her mother and run away, but I did. And um, the soldier at the door, for some reason, allowed me to run. I guess he figured how far would a little child get and how, uh, if he doesn't kill me, somebody else will. That was the last time I saw my mother and my brothers. That whole transport of thousands of people were sent to Treblinka, where they were gassed and burnt. This man took me back to my father. What was my father going to do with me? I wasn't really allowed to be there as a child, as a girl. Um, for a while he had me under the cellar, under the ground with some other people. And then when it was no longer feasible, he dressed me as a boy. And I went to work with the men. And I got away with it. I don't know how. I certainly didn't look that much like a man, and I certainly wasn't big enough. But I got away with it. And we worked in a um, glass factory for many hours a day. As children, we had to carry buckets of water because you needed water for glass, glass blowing, and there was sand. And it was very, very hot, and was, we were always tired, we were always hungry, and we were always scared, and there were always vicious dogs there. I mean, I don't have to go into all the details, I suppose, but just to tell you that life in the uh, factory was very difficult, but every time I think of things being difficult, they were always better than what the future held, which always got worse. When they no longer wanted us in the glass factory, we were transported on those cattle cars, and we must have been taken um, from Germany, from Poland into Germany. Uh, when we crossed the border, um, after three days and three nights of 
being on the trains without food, without water, without any sanitary conditions, no bathroom facilities whatsoever, but that's true of anybody who was on those transports. Um, the doors were open, the dead bodies were thrown out, and the rest of us had to jump down. And there was a big announcement saying the men would go to one side and the women to the other. And my father realized when you'd go into a camp, you'd have to get undressed to take showers for disinfection or whatever reasons. And he realized that they would shoot me on the spot when they found out that I was not one of the men. So he met a school teacher and he asked her if she would keep an eye on me and we would meet after the war. I never saw my father again after that. I don't know if he perished in um, Buchenwald, where most of the men went, or in a death march, or any place else. But after the war, my adopted parents tried to look for any family, and there was nobody left. Anyway, I was taken to Bergen-Belsen with this woman, who turned out to be one of my new mothers. I don't even remember her name. And we were taken into these uh, showers. They really were cold water showers. And uh, we did have to leave all our things there, including some pictures that my father had given me. And um, to the soldier, they were, they were garbage. To me, it would have been the difference to know what, whether my children looked like anybody, whether I looked like anybody, my grandchildren. Um, nothing was left of that. This woman really risked her life to save, to, she stole a black coat that somebody else must have had to leave. And that coat protected us from, um, from the cold, because we were always very, very cold, lying on the stone floor with straw. And um, she did many things to help me. I don't know what happened to her. Uh, but when she disappeared, somebody else came along. As a child, I always had somebody. Um, they wanted to belong to somebody, and I needed to belong to somebody. So that always worked out in my favor. Um, the conditions in Bergen-Belsen, of course, were just terrible. There was very little food, and there was no change of clothes. There were no bathrooms. We had to go out in the, in the fields. And everybody was very sick with typhus and typhoid, including myself. And one day I was lying. I didn't work. Children, I guess they were hoping for a trade or something. And people were just dying because there was so much infectious diseases and, and lack of food and, and drink and no medicines. And one day, uh, people who had always walked around like zombies and not making any noises, they, they, they started running and they started talking, and I had no idea about what was happening. But what happened was that the British came and liberated the camp. And uh, when they liberated the camp, they burned down all the barracks because the, the disease and the smell and the stench was so strong. But they made like a um, tenth city. And because I was one of the lucky ones, I was taken into like a tent hospital and given food and medication and brought back to health. And again, because I was one of the very lucky ones, there were 6,000 people who went to Sweden, and I was amongst those. And I was placed into a displaced persons camp in Sweden, where I was adopted or taken in by another mother, whom I don't know what happened to her. And then I was very sick, so I was placed into a hospital. A Swedish Christian man came to visit me every day, and brought me a doll, and brought me food, and was very good to me. And he wanted to adopt me, and I would have more than gladly gone with him. But the people um, around me said that I was Jewish. I had no idea what that meant. There was really very little memory in those six years. And um, they said I belonged in Palestine, or in Eretz Israel, with the other orphans. While I was waiting to go with the other children, there was a woman who had a son and daughter. Her brother had escaped to the United States before the war, and he sent a passport for those three people and visas and all the necessary papers. The little girl was nine years old, and her name was Fanny. While they were waiting for the ship, she died. Her mother had a passport and all the proper papers, and she asked me if I wanted to be her daughter. So my picture was put into that passport, and I really became that child and came to the United States. Shortly after we came here, this woman died. And the family who brought her really weren't ready to accept another mouth to feed, and really I was a child. They knew of a family in Brooklyn, New York, who were childless, and they invited me for a weekend, and that really started 
the uh, rest of my life I was adopted by them, given a new name. My name is Rina, which means joy. My Yiddish name was Fredel, Fredja in Polish, and it really means the same part of joy, just come to many different changes. Never talked about the Holocaust until 1981 when there was a gathering of Holocaust survivors. And I came to Israel hoping to find somebody or something. I went through all the computers, found nothing. And I realized that um, if nobody puts anything in the computers, I'm not going to find anything. So I went on a search and I wrote to the International Tracing Bureau in Arlson. And I found something that happened uh, or didn't happen. Uh, they knew something about my mother and brothers and something about my me. They didn't know anything about my father. Then I found my name on a list in Sweden, a list in Bergen-Belsen. And I found a card in Yad Vashem which says, Case Closed, Child Adopted in America. And, um, and then I went back to Poland where I found my birth certificate and my brother's birth certificates and my parents' marriage license and the apartment where we lived uh, with the mezuzah still on the door. And the Polish woman who lives there remembered my family. And slowly I've been getting more and more information. Um, that's a short period. When you were going to the camps in the, the ghetto with your father and your mother first and your father and later with other women, how did you understand what was happening to you? Did someone explain? I don't remember anybody explaining, and I just knew, I think that you learn um, uh, just intuition that um, everything that was happening was, it was just happening, it was, it, and it got to be very normal. I mean, you, you realize that you couldn't cry if you were hungry, and you couldn't uh, cry if you got hurt or if you scared, because everybody was in the same position. And um, maybe as a child it was easier to accept it than people who knew the difference what it was like before. I mean, when I saw dead bodies, um, now if I would see something like that, I think I'd run and cry and feel that most awful kind of thing. But that was a normal process because it was just there. Mm -hmm. Did you recall your father explaining to you what No. Thing? No. I don't think anybody explained it. I think he just took it. I don't know that anybody couldn't explain anything like that. It was just such a different world, a different planet. It, it, there was nothing that was the way it was supposed to be. I mean, children weren't supposed to be hungry or, or, or killed or thrown into bonfires or working full time. Could my father say to me, I wish you didn't have to work? He had no choice of that. No. And what, what prompted your, your search for family? Or, or what prompted you to start speaking or that? Well, I hadn't because it was something that nobody wanted to talk about. Everybody was always afraid that they're going to hurt my feelings. I didn't want to bring it up. I didn't want anybody to know I was adopted. I was very much ashamed of that. I didn't want anybody to know that I had been sick. I wanted people to be my friends, and if I was sick, maybe they wouldn't play with me or talk to me. And then as I grew up, it just, um, it just didn't come up. I think everybody was very careful not to mention it. When I was going to school, when I first came to the United States, I went to a private school, a Jewish school, and the class went to see a movie called My Father's House. And um, the teachers and the principal and my parents agreed that I should not go to see anything about that. Instead, I was taken to see Pinocchio. So people were trying to um, um, shelter me, I guess, shield me from these different things. In 1981, I just decided it was time to stop putting my head into the you know, ground like an ostrich. And the gathering was there. It was the first big gathering that they had. And I came, I came with my children. And we started looking. And once I realized that there's a possibility of finding things, we just went on. Then in 1984, when we made Aliyah, both my husband and I decided to volunteer for different things. And I decided to volunteer in Yad Vashem. So um, what I do in Yad Vashem is give tours to tourists or to school groups and to give testimony. And um, at first it was very, very difficult. Then it gets easier as you talk about it. Why was it difficult? Uh, it was difficult because every time you'd get to a certain subject, you would just sort of start crying and um, have to catch your breath and say, you know what, you've got to go on regardless. 
um, it never gets completely easy. I mean, the story doesn't change, but you sort of, you know, learn to um, to accept it anymore. I also think that if we were spared, there was a reason for us to live. And I'm not quite sure exactly what the reason, whether I was meant to live so that I would marry the man I didn't have his children or grandchildren. And maybe I wasn't that important what they were, but we were needed as a link. But I also feel it was a, with a privilege came a responsibility. And there's so many people who deny the Holocaust now that I think it's important for a person to say, I was there, I saw it. It's not just a history. And as long as I'm in that position, I'd like to do it. Were there any events in the history of Israel and America that made you reflect on the Shoah in a different way or made you think about it? Aspect that you hadn't thought about before that was going on in the world, in the Jewish world? Um, in the Jewish world, well, uh, when my adopted father died, I was very close to him. And um, in the Jewish religion, in the Orthodox, I imagine probably all seconds, um, the children, the wife or husband, um, parents, have something called kriya, which is rendering the garments. Um, at my father's funeral, this rabbi, it was a very, very traumatic experience for me, did um, the rendering of the garment for my mother and for my aunt and uncle, who were the brother and sister of my father. And he was finished. And somebody said, you forgot Rena. And she, they said, well, she wasn't really his daughter, which sort of, um, whether you were thinking about it or not, that was not the time to think about it or bring it up. And many people in that audience probably didn't even know. It wasn't something that went around. So whether you want to think about things, uh, the Holocaust or not, they're there and they come out. And the same thing happened two days ago. I went to the doctor for um, a checkup. When you go to a doctor for the first time, he asks you your medical history. Does anybody have diabetes? Does anybody, um, anybody die of a heart attack, uh, um, high blood pressure? And, my answer is, I don't know, and they sort of look at you as if, I'll explain it to you, what it means. I say, you don't have to explain it. I know what you're, what you're asking. I just don't have the answers, and I never will. I don't know if that's historically what you're looking for. No, I think that uh, bring it up for you, I think that make you a clinic. Yeah. During the Gulf War, um, it was very, very much brought up because everybody in the country was very much afraid. We had no idea what was going to happen with the scads. And um, uh, some of my children brought their children, my grandchildren here, while they went out to work. When things got to be where you could go out to work, but uh, the sirens would go off at night, and uh, we stayed together. And um, I, I felt that maybe we should get passports for the, uh, for the babies. They were all babies. You can see them lying here like that. So we, we do a lot of babysitting. And um, maybe there's a chance of running away, which would make a lot of sense. Nobody in my family thought the way I did. I mean, my daughters, I have three daughters living here, they said their husbands would have to go into the Air Force or into the Army. They would be needed to help them. So I said, OK, if you have to stay. Why are the children staying? Why does a three-month-old or a two-year-old or a five-year-old have to be here? But um, nobody else thought of running away, the only one who felt there was a need for it. I also bought more food than the stores had <laughs> to keep uh, supplied and uh, uh, listened to the radio. It, it, I also felt how lucky we were to have a state of Israel and, um, and the gas masks and, and that I was a grandmother who was keeping her children away from the gas where the other grandmothers in the Shoah, they were given their children and they were usually the first ones to be taken. So because we have a state of Israel, and because we are where we are today, we're in a much better situation. Do you feel a difference in being a survivor in the state opposed to Israel? Uh, only because I got so involved, and I talk about the Holocaust now, whereas in the States I really never did. And many of the people, I speak English like an American, because I never knew any other language, because I was a child and I went to school there. So many people didn't know them. It's not the first thing that comes up. 
It's just here that I've sort of gotten a reputation, like you called me, because you knew in the States you wouldn't have known, so you wouldn't have called me. So I'm very much more involved with it here. Maybe, you know, with the Holocaust Museums coming up in the States, had I gotten involved there, maybe. But this is a closer community, so people sort of learn from one another. I'm also much more interested in it. Why do you think Why am I more interested? First of all, I'm always searching. And I'm helping other people to search and peek. There are places to find. And more and more things are available, both in Yad Vashem and um, in, in the various tracing bureaus, even the American Red Cross. And uh, I guess I'm not as afraid of touching it. A few years ago, an aunt of mine asked me whether I'm in touch with the people who hid me, the Christians who hid me. And I said, Aunt Ruthie, I was never hidden by Christians. And she said, well, all children who was saved. And she just never asked me, and I never told her. It was just something we didn't tell because here people do talk about it. How do you think you were able to touch it now? I, I, I'm more surrounded with it, and I'm more interested in it. And I'm just not as afraid. I think my grandchildren are also more interested than my children. Well, we, I never really talked about it with my children. Whatever they knew, they sort of picked out. Whereas my grandchildren are, are learning it in school. Um, my older ones have been to Yad Vashem, and they've interviewed me. You know, for school, for Yom show every child has to go and ask somebody who's a survivor, so they sort of know, whereas my children didn't have to do that. Did you feel that you wanted to tell children? No. 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 Not at all. I, and I don't know which comes first. Is it that the children would ask or that you would tell? Now, I've gone to second-generation uh, conferences where I've heard of children who say my, my parents talk about it all the time, and, 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 you know, it's a good tidy about it. And then you have other people saying, you're lucky because my parents never talk about it, and I have no idea who my relatives were. So I guess it's, it's the situation you're placed in. It's the environment you're placed in. But my grandchildren seem to be much more interested. I think my, by now, I, I've also been asked to speak to people, so they've come to hear me, and by now it's a very open thing. Mm -hmm. Any particular thing person that represents your experience or you identify as being someone who represents your story or the story of the Shoah, writer, or is that a survivor, or? Well, there are many books that you read in that you um, that you, you identify with. Elie Wiesel's Night, the way he describes Jennings, Primo Levi. Uh, there are many. Um, uh, we're having a speaker, Olivia Jackson, who wrote a book, Ellie, as a child. M most of these people were older than I. Um, you, you read many of the children. As I said, most of the children's, the autobiographies that I've read of, about children were children who were in hiding. And um, um, there are very few children, really, who were in the camps. I mean, the children were the first ones to be killed or who died. Um, but there are an awful lot of good books. The book, The Survivor, by uh, Terence DeFray, discusses feelings that you can put yourself into. Um, lots and lots of books. Mm -hmm. What about Eddie Rizal? In his book, Night, you started to... Well, he discusses how he felt about on, on the train, how he felt about the cold, how he saw his father. And it's it's just a very moving, very difficult kind of thing to, to see. But any, any book on the Holocaust, um, you read it knowing that it's happened to other people, but you also put yourself into it. Or in Schindler's List, which is the movie you watch it, and I don't know if you remember that um, uh, there was a little girl in a red coat. Mm -hmm. And then there were piles of clothes, and there was the red coat. The movie was in black and white. I didn't know if anybody else saw that red coat. It made such a huge impression on me, the clothing. And then I spoke to other people. Other people didn't see it also. Um, so I guess you brought out the things that... Why the red coat? Why did it speak to you? So because it was a child's coat, or child's children's shoes. Maybe 
strongly against in terms of representation? There are many people who claim that, um, that everybody was out for themselves. Even in Ali Rizal's book, how people stole bread from each other and how they stole shoes and how people trampled over each other and things like that. And I know it happened. I mean, I, 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 I don't fool myself at not. But on a personal basis, or I heard a survivor talking about how terrible the Swedes were, or how terrible this one was, I just keep on thinking of myself that I would not have been saved had people not gone out of their way to help me. As a child, I could not possibly have done it alone. I wasn't so smart, I wasn't so wise, I wasn't so strong. So the, when I hear about other people not helping each other, I, I accept it, but I don't identify. The first time I went back was in 1989. There was a trip that Yad Vashem uh, was giving to their staff, and as volunteers we were uh, allowed to go. We paid our own way and took our own food because the trip was paid and it was not kosher. And most of the people didn't care, we did. And um, it was the first time, it was very frightening, but it turned out to be a very um, moving experience because, as I said, I went to the town hall. And I don't know what would have happened had I not found my birth certificate. Would it have proved that I wasn't born? You know, I doubt that. But the fact that you have proof that what you're saying, many of the things that I used to think about by myself and not discuss it, I sometimes doubted myself. Not that anybody said so, but I kept on saying, how do I prove this? Going back to Ketrick and finding the glass factory where I worked, and finding the apartment and the woman who remembered my father, and seeing the kiosk across the street from a balcony and somehow other that stood out in my mind was um, very revealing for me. And then I'd been back several times because I was, I was asked to go with the March of the Living mm -hmm. as a survivor. Mm -hmm. And then you're sort of not looking for yourself, but you're looking to, to tell students about what happened and their questions. And some of the things were very moving. I, um, um, the first time I went, uh, we went to Treblinka, and Treblinka has 17,000 volcanic stones that the the Polish government made to look like tombstones, and sort of like a memorial. And some of the stones have names, and one of the stones has the name of Pietrakov. I couldn't find it. You know, it was, it's huge, and, and didn't know just where to look. When I came back, I had spoken to Rabbi Lau, who, whose father was the the rabbi in our hometown. He's the chief rabbi here and his brother Naftali Lavi, and they told me approximately where it was. When I went with back with the March of the Living, and every bus that I spoke to, I said, you know what, I'd like everybody to help me. If you, anybody sees the stone of Pietrakov, I would so appreciate it if you would tell me. And I spoke to one bus of um, um, teenagers who, I wasn't sure that they were really so in tune in what they were going for. These are teenagers who, um, almost stereotyped when I talk about it because they were good kids, but earrings in their nose and earrings in their ears and earrings on their um, and the eyebrows and, um, uh, you know, laughing and going on. And I talked to them and I said, I wonder whether anything is penetrating. And um, when we got into Treblinka, one of those boys <laughs> that I've just described to you started running over to me and he said, I mean, I found it. I found it. I prayed that I would find it. I found the stone, and he pulled me over, and he says, I wanted so much to find it, because he came from South America. Half of his family was Jewish, half was not. He didn't know any Holocaust survivors. There was no religion in his life. He wanted to be part of the Jewish people. He felt now that he found my stone, he belonged to us. So you never know what kind of impression you're going to make. I mean, he was the most unlikely kid, and it, it made a tremendous impression on him and certainly on me. I think it's a very important thing. I mean, right now there's talk about going to Poland or not. I, when, when I've gone um, with the groups, I found that it, it's, it's a wonderful way of teaching about the Holocaust. But even more importantly, it's it's a way of showing that all Jews, whether they were religious or not, were in the same category, and also to show how very important the state of Israel was. If we had a state of Israel to run to at that time, how many people could have possibly been saved? And I think that anybody who goes to Poland and comes to Israel and thinks about it, it's, it's made a tremendous impression. 
for example, those students in that class who, I mean, you had a very well, great experience in terms of him. Well, you see, I, I, you see, I, I, I didn't know what to expect, and apparently it made a huge difference. And what they were thinking and what they looked like was very different. You know, when you see kids with bandanas and long hair and then, you know, showing around and listening to loud music, you wonder, are they really going to be interested in this? Apparently they were. I guess the fact that they even, I don't know if they were sent there or came there, but it made a tremendous difference. I don't know of anybody who went who didn't come back very, very much. Not an easy trip to take, and anybody who's a um, sensitive person really has to be prepared well for it. Did you bring up stuff for you that you hadn't thought about going back? Oh, sure. Um, you know, when you go into the barracks and you see the stone floor and you, you just can't help picturing the straw and the lice eating away there, and certain smells come back, you know, you go into a a bathroom with the urinal and everybody smelled like that and uh, the coldness you walk through Auschwitz and that coldness that's, that wind that's going through it just uh, goes through your bones and, and, and you feel it and you just can't believe that um, that this possibly could have happened to you or to anybody else in 1981 when I came here <laughs> I, had, I had some very funny experiences that I I couldn't believe, and I thought they were so wonderful. We were at Binyaneha Uma, which was near the Hilton Hotel at the time. And the bathrooms, of course, you always have to wait online. So some of us went to the Hilton to use the bathroom there. And there was a line on the ladies' room. And as I was waiting, a well-dressed woman came out and she said, oh, those bathrooms are so dirty. <laughs> and I said, you know what? We have bathrooms at the Hilton, and a lot of people were using them, so maybe some paper farms. I mean, this woman probably didn't have a bathroom for years <laughs> to use the uh, the field, and 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 she's able to to think about it. And then I went to the plaza, and there was a woman with a number on her arm who was trying on a dress, and she wasn't sure if the red one was good or the blue one was good. I, isn't it wonderful that we can? choose and we can not choose and, 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 and you forget about the past and you want to be a normal person and I mean in those days if anybody gave you a garbage bag to put on you would feel that you were lucky so it's, it's I, 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 you know it's just the kind of thing that you think about uh, um, made me laugh but it, it's wonderful that people do forget <laughs> how do you think they manage themselves I mean it's very easy, <laughs> you know, it's very easy when, well, it's not easy. I mean, you, 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 you know, you go to a wedding and, and many survivors will tell you that I, uh, uh, I'm having this wedding and I can't help thinking that none of my family is here and how everybody would have enjoyed this and so on and so forth. But, um, you know, you don't forget that way. But um, if you look at most survivors, they have made successful lives and they have started families. People wanted to start families very quickly. They wanted to belong to somebody so that you very often had marriages that weren't, wasn't just for love, it was for comfort. Or you'd have um, an educated man marrying a very simple woman or a very educated woman marrying an old man. They just wanted to belong. But once you make a life of yourself, you you do. I mean, you, you, you know, most survivors, I, I once had a group of survivors here, and if you look at my house, it's green and white, and quite light and colorful. And this group came, and they didn't know. This was a group of Christian um, students, and they wanted to meet an Israeli, and they did not know that I was a Holocaust survivor. I invited them to the house. We do a lot of home hospitality. And um, we got to talking about the Holocaust, and I said, well, what do you think a Holocaust survivor looks like? And they gave me their descriptions, and what do you think their house would be like? And I said, it's probably gray and dark and gloomy. And um, I said, well, would you believe that my home, which is exactly the opposite of that? And they found it hard to believe. And then I told my daughter, because I thought it was a funny experience, and she says, you know, I never realized why you like green so much, but maybe it's because it is life and light. Now, I don't know if it's true. Maybe I just like the color just to be like, I like blue and red also. But you can look into and read into everything, I suppose. So you say it's quite, I mean, it 
just being an easy thing in terms of splitting up that. Oh yes, yes. I'm not. I'm not that child in everyday life. No. No. I've had the first ten years of my life was a totally different life than most children have. But after that, it was a very normal American teenager, and then I got married and had children. And no, I don't think about it. Is your, is your husband? My husband is not a survivor, and he was never really interested until we came to Israel, and it's so much, very much part of our lives. Okay. But um, in the States, we never really talked about it very much. He always knew. Did you want to talk about it now? No. No, there was no, there was no purpose in it. Also, I think as I was growing up, you didn't have the young. No, there was no, there was no purpose in it. Also, I think as I was growing up, you didn't have the young Hashoa. Uh, commemorations that you do now. I think most people are more open now. In the States, there was no siren. Um, I read all, uh, every day in the paper now, there's about the Holocaust. You ask me what it pertains to me. The claims conference and the, and the slave labor and compensations, things like that. I have no interest in it. And um, I mean, thankfully, we don't really need it in, in monetary terms the way some survivors do, and I wouldn't even know how. I mean, if I would have to go to see if there's records of when I was a, working in a slave labor camp, I don't even know what name I used. I was a boy at the time with a different name. Um, that doesn't really interest me, but I think it's important that other people do do it. Why? Why shouldn't they get paid for what they deserve, and why shouldn't they, they have some compensation for their losses? I, would have, I, I don't even know that the house that I lived in belonged to my parents. They were very young, they were 26 when I was born. But if it didn't belong to them, maybe it belonged to their parents. I have no way of proving it, but people who can certainly should get what's rightfully theirs. It was taken away from them. And anybody who worked as a slave laborer or who lost their education or who lost everything that they owned and, and the artworks and the gold or, or the um, uh, life insurance policies, I mean, I don't know where the question why is. Why not? Sometimes going back. Well, why not? If, you're, if, if you've been hurt in an accident, sometimes that case takes a long time, but uh, you're entitled to, to what's rightfully yours. You're asking me whether I believe, for instance, uh, which is a question that many people ask, do you believe in God or do you believe in religion? I believe very strongly in God. I want very much to be an Orthodox Jew, and I have brought up my children that way, and they want it that way also. I don't understand where God was. I don't understand how this could have happened. I don't think I could have been saved unless God meant for me to be saved, but I don't know why he chose me and not a million and a half other children and adults, six million other people. I can't give any explanation there now, but I think it's very, very important for, for us to live the kind of life, very important for me to live the kind of life that I'm living as a, um, a Jewish observant people because Hitler wanted to wipe out all the Jews by assimilating, by intermarrying, we're sort of helping him along on his cause. The other day I heard a very good lecture um, Actually, it wasn't a lecture. I spoke to a group of Christians, and the person who introduced me, this is from the uh, Bridges for Peace. If you heard of it, it's a Christian group that comes to Israel and believes very much in the Jews living in Israel. And the person who introduced me said, you know, we're all responsible for anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism started with the church and started with the, the Christianity, and the Jews were blamed for all kinds of things. And um, the church and the Christians could have done a great deal to prevent um, 
anti-Jewish riots. And uh, he says, we were very lucky because Hitler did the job for us. So, um, and he says, and now we have to make up for that. And I was introduced. So I sort of said, you know, it was such a perfect introduction to put it. He really said so much more than I would have dared say to a group of Christians. And I uh, sort of said to them, you know, I'm so glad to see a group like this coming and be our friends. If we had people in the night, late 1930s and 40s, if the, the, um, the countries had opened their gates to us, if the state of Israel had been born, if there were more righteous amongst the nations trying to help us. But we didn't have so many friends. And to be perfectly honest, we don't have so many friends now. An awful lot of countries still hate Israel. But if we have people like these Christians coming to help us, at least we're grateful for them. What do you feel about Germany? Well, as a nation, I, I, I feel very strongly against them. I would never go to Germany. and We've traveled a great deal and have never gone there. But I have met Germans in the Abishem who come who wished it didn't happen. So I guess we sort of can blame some of the newer people who are coming here. I think the people who hate us, who despise us, who don't admit it happened, I don't meet them. They're not the ones who are coming here. And I'm not about to go there. I think someone like um, William Goldhagen, who wrote the book where he blames not only the Nazis or Gestapo, but all Germans, I, I think he's got a very good point there. Because I think that you don't have to be just the, uh, the person who goes out killing. If you're a bystander who does nothing about it or protests against it, you're also to blame. And the Pope? And the Pope? And the Pope? The Poles. The same thing. There were many Poles who were perfectly happy to get rid of the, the woman who moved into our apartment, you know, claims that when the Jews moved out, she moved in. Now, for her, this was a great coup. I mean, they, they were able to get many of these different things. Um, I have a different feeling than some of the people that, that I went with on the March of the Living or other times because they all look at the Poles, hating them and feeling that the Poles would like to kill us now and take everything that we have. And, and uh, they're probably right. On the other hand, I found it amazing, I guess it's my personality that I look at the positive of it, that um, uh, Israeli security guards hired Polish people to act as security guards also. And there were these Poles with guns protecting Jewish children. And that was their job, whether they wanted to or not, whether they had a different kind of feeling. But this was it, and I think it's just very ironic. Uh, to, you know, to um, to see how things have changed. Uh, I also have no desire to go to Poland or to get my property back. I mean, I'd like to get it back just as a vengeance or because the right thing, but I certainly wouldn't want to live in Poland. It's not something, if I'd have an apartment there, I'd go for vacation. Absolutely not. How do you, how do you respond when you heard this kind of uh, idea coming through much of it about about They're probably true. I think many of the Poles probably do hate the people, and I think the story with the crosses at Auschwitz right now, where uh, uh, they think that the Jews were part of the Poles. But during the Holocaust, they weren't. There was very much difference between being a Polish Pole or a Polish Jew. And there still is a difference in every country, though. Mm -hmm. Maybe some people have tried to make money of it and somehow, but I think all the museums and all the books and the more movies that are coming up are, um, are, I would say, more positive than negative. And if people are making money by it, someone like Steven Spielberg called her Cabo because um, the more you show people, the more you teach people, the more they're aware of it. So I think every museum that goes up, every book that comes out, every movie is beneficial. Despite what it's about? I really haven't seen anything that I thought was so... Oh, yeah, there was once an exhibit in, um, in the Israel Museum, an art exhibit showing Hitler and his sex life. Did you see that? Oh, it was awful. Um, I went because people were talking about it, and I figured I have to see what they're talking about. It. 
Um, I know a lot of people objected to the to book Mouse because it was done in cartoons. Uh, there's a movie which I haven't seen called um, Light is Beautiful. Life is Beautiful. Have you seen it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's supposed to be in Hebrew, with, in, with, in Italian with Hebrew subtitles. I don't know how much I'll, I'll understand, but I want to see it because I want to know what people are talking about. And people sort of felt, how do you just joke around about the Holocaust? But if it teaches people, um, there was a very good movie that I saw not long ago about Jacob the Liar, uh, where this man was arrested because he was out past curfew. And while he was in the... Um, in that trial in the court, he overheard that the Russians were coming closer. And when he was allowed out, he told everybody, he knows that the Russians are coming closer. And the more he told, the more into a lie he got. But people started believing him and having hope and, and wanting to live rather than committing suicide or, uh, or running away. And the more he got himself embroiled, the more he said so. And of course, at the end, the Russians were not coming so close. Uh, was she wrong in lying? I mean, it was what the movie was about. It gives you an awful lot to think about. If somebody could get hope from something like that, maybe what he did was absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And this man in this Life is Beautiful is trying to show his child, apparently, of how to keep alive through humor. It wasn't that he was making a joke about the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think I also object to people, you know, every time that there's a fight or there's a, a massacre or there's an incident, everybody says, oh, these people are Nazis and it's a Holocaust.